stand together as we read God's word this morning. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have not asked nothing in my name. Ask that, and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is com coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that, you will that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I have come from God. And I, ha I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father's. His disciples said, Ah, oh, now you are speaking plainly, not in figures of speech. We know that you know all things and do not need uh, anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answers them, uh, Do you now, now believe? Behold, the hour is um, coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you, have, you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Thank you. you may be seated. One of the fears that people face in answering the call of Jesus to follow him, and that's a call Jesus makes to every one of us, will you follow me? One of the fears that we face in that call, in entering a personal relationship with God through Jesus, is what am I going to have to give up to do this? What is God going to take from me? in order for me to do this. Now we know Jesus on a couple of occasions mentioned the costs that are involved in following Him. And when people are aware of costs involved in anything, it can easily deter them or create some uneasiness about the call. But I think we need to realize, and something I'm realizing more and more in my life, the decision to follow Jesus is made much easier when we understand all the benefits and the blessings that Jesus wants to give us. Because I think one of the things that's often misunderstood is following Jesus means there's a lot of things that are going to change, a lot of things are going to be taken from me, a lot of things are this, that, and the other things. And one of the things that we fail to mention in following Jesus, we are following a Savior who is a giving Savior. He's a Savior that wants to give us things, not take things from us. He wants to supply us with resources and blessings that we can't get any other place in this world. They're heavenly in nature. They're spiritual in nature. They're eternal in nature. Things that, that bring newness to life, they bring longevity and encouragement into our soul because of what Christ is offering to us and what he brings to us. So um, Jesus wants us to give, these, give us these resources. And when we learn that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, I can say with great confidence that every one of us will receive far more from Jesus then he will ever ask us to give or sacrifice to following him. He will give us so much more. And I think you need to see your Savior as that. He's a giving Savior. He didn't just give his life on the cross to save us from our sins. He, had, he gives us rich and abundant resources. And we want to look at some of those today. Because salva the salvation that God offers us through Jesus Christ to us 
comes with many benefits for us to enjoy. And these benefits were designed to enrich, fulfill, and satisfy our lives in a relationship that we enjoy with God through Jesus Christ. Sometimes relationships aren't always enjoyable. The one that God offers to us in Jesus is certainly designed to be enjoyable for all those who take part of it, who, who enter that relationship by faith. Now, one of the difficulties that we might face as disciples of Jesus is not having the awareness of the benefits that are available to us, right? We may not know about that. So in John chapter 14 through 16, as we've been studying this lengthy final discourse, final teaching, final instruction that Jesus gave to his disciples before he died on the cross, before he was risen from the grave, before he ascended into heaven, before all of these events took place, Jesus sought to prepare his disciples for what was going to take place in the moments to come. And in preparing them, he was preparing them for a life without his active physical presence among them, right? And for all disciples who would come in future generations. And so Jesus sought to share with his disciples all the resources and benefits they would begin to enjoy with him in heaven and his spirit at work in their lives. Now, certainly... They would live much more effective lives, more dynamic lives, more fruitful lives as disciples if they took advantage of these benefits, if they used them effectively in their lives and would receive from these benefits uh, what they were meant to experience in their lives. I kind of liken it to our governor, our government. It's very huge, right? Our government has lots of things. It has lots of programs, has lots of services, has lots of aid, lots of grants, lots of funding. Um, Kids that are seniors in high school find this out when they're uh, trying to, you know, get scholarships. Um, There's so much out there. The problem is most people don't know how to get it or or access it. Uh, There's so many resources that the government has in programs and all these kinds of things, but very few people know about How do I access all these benefits from our uh, massive tax dollars and overspending? I I should say that, but that's kind of how these programs get going. And and so, uh, but, but one of the things we realize about Jesus, it's not quite like that way. It's not the case in the Christian life. All the benefits of life in Christ are spelled out, right? They're in the Bible so that we can access them, so that we can find them out and when we learn about them, we can thrive in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can thrive in this relationship. So as we turn our Bibles to two verses today, John 16, verses 23 through 24, I I see three gifts, three enrichments, three valuable benefits that Jesus gives to us as his disciples. And, And I think these are things, these are wonderful gifts, wonderful benefits when you think about them. When you truly take time to think about the benefits that are being offered to us, that are being stated to us for our enjoyment in this passage, um, I, think, I think that you will find them very rewarding, very important, very necessary for your spiritual life. The first thing, uh, benefit, is the benefit of spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding. Spiritual knowledge. Spiritual wisdom and insight. Jesus is talking about that in verse 23 when he says... In that day. Now you're going, what does he mean in that day? In that day could mean a lot of things, potentially. Uh, we hear the day often refers to the day of the Lord when, when that is coming, when all things are going to come to their conclusion and all the things that are spoken about in the book of Revelation begin to unfold and we can see things drawing closer and closer to that day. And so that is one of the in that days that's talked about in uh, the scriptures, but I believe that in this day that Jesus is talking about here to his disciples is the day when everything that Jesus has told his disciples, right, that he's reminded them is coming, and as he's preparing them for what will take place in that day, 
It's the combination of his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. All these things, when all these things are fulfilled, when all these things happen, that's what in this day is, is, is all about. You see, salvation cannot happen without a crucifixion, right? For the Son cannot be glorified without a resurrection. And without a resurrection of, of Jesus from the dead, the Spirit cannot come. And the Spirit cannot come until the Son is seated at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus says in that day, when all these events that he's alluded to, that he's told and kind of made known to the disciples, to their a little bit of their shock and awe and their kind of, their kind of wonderment of, like, how is this going to take? Well, what are you talking about, Jesus? Up to this time, you know, he says, in that day you will ask me no questions. In that day you will ask me no questions. I mean, up, in t- up until this time, and just a few verses before, uh, the disciples had lots of questions. They had lots of puzzled looks that they gave to Jesus. Things they, they just didn't understand. I mean, some of the parables that Jesus taught, some of the things that Jesus had been communicating about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, um, all these spiritual insights that were just so new to everybody on the planet, because here's God in human flesh beginning to teach people about things they'd never heard about before in their life, and they're just a little bit not sure of this, or they're not understanding all of this. And even though they haven't expressed it verbally, a host of questions we can see that they're struggling at times to understand everything Jesus is saying to them. And I'm sure during the course of the events and the teaching um, of these last moments of John 14 through 16, Jesus has faced um, a lot of strange looks, a lot of puzzled expression. He saw men who were wanting to put everything together for their understanding, trying to comprehend things, but they can't. I don't know about you, I don't like to be clueless about anything, but you know I'm clueless about a lot of things, especially when it comes to tools and fixing things and putting things together, like, like those, those projects that you get that are all in a box and all those things are in there with all the widgets and all the, the Allen wrenches and this, and, and, and you got to put that thing together. You know, there's, there's, sometimes I'm really clueless when it comes to things like that. And some of you guys are very clued into things like that, that might be clueless about other things, like how to hit a golf ball straight. But most days I'm very clueless about that, but there are a few days when I figure that out. But anyway, you know, there are things in life we don't like to be clueless about. We don't like to be left out in the dark. And so here they weren't able to make sense of a lot of the things Jesus was saying. kind of reminds me when I was in college. It's been a long time ago, kids. You can see by my gray hair. It was a long time since I've been in college. But when I was in college, I was required to take a class called Probability and Statistics. Yeah, it just sounds like that, doesn't it? And uh, the Honorable Paul Vinsky was the Ph.D. from Purdue uh, University where he got his work. And uh, he was quite an interesting fellow, you know. He, He wore the same clothes every day. Same old pair of boots. Cowboy boots, and they were always over the top of the leg. Pant leg was not like neatly over the top of his boots. He had just come from his office, and he had a pipe stuck in his belt. And uh, he was he was he was so intelligent, right? He was just so smart. And I sat through that class on probability and statistics, and for the most of the semester, I went, huh, huh. I knew mathematician was not my calling. I just knew it was not my calling. And there were many puzzled looks, I'm sure, Dr. Vinsky got from me when he he looked out there, uh, probably from a lot of students that were taking probability and statistics, right? Um, That just kind of takes a certain kind of brain to get that kind of stuff, and I didn't have that brain. And so I was there, you know, just, just struggled to get it. But Jesus says in that day, when the cross has come, when the resurrection has taken place, when the Holy Spirit comes, he says, you'll ask me no questions. Why? Why aren't you going to ask me any questions? As they witness the events take place that Jesus has said, everything that puzzled them, that confused them before, would all sort of make sense. It all come to light. 
It all come, all the pieces of the puzzle would sort of fit together. Once the once fuzzy picture would come into focus. Now, it's not like they wouldn't still have questions, but they would possess a much fuller revelation and understanding of Jesus that that would provide answers for their question. And I believe one of the extreme benefits of being blessed in having a relationship with God in Jesus Christ, with the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit with us all the time in our lives, is spiritual understanding, spiritual wisdom. Spiritual knowledge, spiritual insight into the mind, the heart, the plan, the ways of God that people with Christ just don't have. You have insight into what God is communicating, what, how God has planned things out, how God has a beginning and an end, and all the things that are happening in the middle. It's like we are provided in Christ spiritual glasses. Now, my eyesight is getting to the point of where I'm going to need glasses, right? Things aren't as clear. And so early in the morning when I get up and poke on my iPad, I can can look at the screen because the font is just small enough, it's all blurred, right? It just doesn't make any sense to me. It's all a bunch of jumble. And you know what? There's a lot of people who will look at this Bible and they'll look at it and they'll go, I don't understand it. I can't figure it out. What is this all about? What, what is it saying? What is it teaching? What is its purpose? You know, I've heard certain things about what it says, but I really don't know. But Jesus, when he comes and becomes a real part of your life, as you trust in him, one of the things he promises to give you is spiritual understanding. His spirit is there to illuminate so that we have spiritual glasses to where we can grow in our understanding of the wisdom of God. And you say, so how is that beneficial to me? Well, when you have spiritual wisdom and understanding, as things begin to unfold in the world, like what we see happening in Israel, in the Middle East, in Iran, Iraq, and all over the globe, we can begin with spiritual eyes, understand how they begin to relate to Scripture and God's plans for the ages. We are blessed to have spiritual insight to understand some of the most significant and powerful life-transforming truths the world has ever known. It's a tremendous gift from God to us. When you are given spiritual glasses through your faith in Jesus Christ and spiritual understanding and insight into the truth of God's Word, you have answers to the question that people have about what happens to me when I die. You can answer people. You know for yourselves what happens to you when you die. You know about the afterlife and how you get there, and how you experience a future in heaven and eternity with God. God has given us rich resources and spiritual blessings in His Word to supply us with the answers for the difficult questions of life. To keep us from going down, dead-end paths in life. Because I have to say, so often, that's the path many people are on in life. They're called dead-end paths. They're paths that they think are going to accomplish something. And it was so amazing this week that um, an announcement came out that um, somebody realized that what they provided for years was very much a dead-end path, and that was Playboy magazine. They're not going to print the pictures anymore. Why? Because it's a dead-end path. It doesn't satisfy people. They, they can get much more salacious and ugly stuff on the Internet, and they're all finding out that the more you have this, the less it satisfies you. I think Lamar Odom is, is another one of those indications, trying to find that sexual high, doing all this stuff and finding out, even if he gets it, it's never going to be enough. It's never going to satisfy his soul. Everybody thinks you get more money, you get more of this, you get the car you want, you get the house you want, you get the boat you want, you get the camper you want, you get this, that, or you get the job you want, that life is just going to be 
peaches and cream and everything great, and you find out you get it, and you always want something else. Or it just didn't have the quite the edge. I didn't know I would have to do this much maintenance on these things. I didn't know, you know, all these kinds of things. Because people fail to realize without spiritual glasses, the only thing that can satisfy them is Jesus Christ. He's the only thing that can satisfy you. And that only comes through spiritual understanding, spiritual light that God sheds into our hearts, into our lives through Jesus. He has given us His Spirit to help us understand His revelation, His truth, spiritual insight that, that you can't get. People are on New Age searches through yoga and through meditation and through uh, the, the latest book that's being written about this or that or the other thing. And New Age is really old age. It's still it's stuff that's been around society and culture since its beginning. Seeking to find a, a, a meaning to life outside of God. That's, what, that's really what it is. I'm trying to find meaning to my life outside of God. And, and you see this with a lot of the, the, the experiential things that are, that are going on all over the world. People are looking for something because they do not have the spiritual glasses, the spiritual insight. It's not that it hasn't been provided to them. They just don't want to really look in to see what God has to say because God has the plan uh, of a wonderful future for us. And uh, he tells us how we got our beginning. He told us why we have to die and why we have to face the penalty of sin and death because of our sins. But God came to rescue us through Jesus Christ to provide us a salvation, to provide us a hope beyond the, the dismal part of when you go to a grave and when you go to a funeral. Uh, Jesus has conquered that grave. And we only get that insight, that understanding from the Word of God and the wisdom that the Holy Spirit brings to us. So one of the blessings and benefits that God gives to us is spiritual insight. But it's amazing how often disciples sort of just don't have time to check out the wisdom and understanding that God gives to them. How we can be so busy about our lives and all that we're doing that we don't really seek out what God has provided for us to give us the strength to make good decisions, to give us the wisdom and counsel, to know how to, to, to raise our children and to know how to, to love each other in our relationships with one another, both in our home and outside of our home. And so God's wisdom is truly wonderful and valuable. But the question is, are you taking advantage of it? God has given you the spiritual glasses to see realities that many people don't see, but, but do we take advantage of it? Do we really look at it? Do we really seek to understand it? The second benefit that we've been provided by God the Father is access to God the Father by, through the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer, right? God gives us the privilege of prayer, gives us the benefit of praying, Gives us the benefit of direct access, access to our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ. And you notice in John 14 through 16, several times in the text, Jesus has made mention of this. In John 14, verse 13, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 15, ver 15 verse 16, he says, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He may give it to you. Because this is a repeated phrase, we must notice that Jesus wants His disciples to know that through Him and in His name, they have direct access to the Heavenly Father. Now, you notice two things about this access. It's granted or made possible in the name of Jesus, because of Jesus, because what he's accomplished on the, the cross for our sins. And the second thing is, it encourages us to ask God for the things we need. We can ask God for the things we need. You see, as disciples continuing on the work of Jesus in this world, we're going to have needs, right? We're going to encounter situations that we will need God to ask us to supply us with needs that we can't meet on our own. And so we're given the privilege of doing this. We're given the privilege of asking God to do things we can't do. Right? To do miraculous things. To do powerful things. 
to do things that are beyond our scope and our abilities. And so the disciples continuing on the work of Jesus in this world, they're asked, they're encouraged to ask. We're given the privilege to ask. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time sometimes asking. Difficult time asking. We're not people that generally like to ask anything of anyone. There's a part of our pride, you know, that really wants to believe that we don't have needs, right? Or at least we don't want people to think we have needs, even though we have them. We have lots of needs. We just don't want people to think we have needs. So it's very difficult for us. So uh, one of the things we have to know is that God doesn't look down on us for asking. In James chapter 1, it says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives that wisdom generously without, what? Finding fault. In other words, God is going, oh, you're back here again, huh? You know, that isn't the way God treats us. God wants us to come because God wants us to know that he is a rich resource of strength, of wisdom, of help, of, of everything, and that we can depend on. We can trust in him. We trusted him to save us from our sins in Jesus Christ. We can trust him to take care of the needs that we have in life. And so we are in courage to pray. We're exhorted to pray. And we're asked to pray in the name of Jesus. And praying in the name of Jesus is simply praying in his name according to his will. Right? Asking in Jesus' name and receiving in Jesus' name is really synonymous with asking for the things that are in direct line with the will of God and the purpose of God. Because we may think that we need a Mercedes Benz, but Jesus may not think that might be best for us. Right? We might think we might need... So praying in the will of God is just praying for the things that will glorify God, that will see God's name great. And the things that you can always pray for are wisdom, for strength. Pray, praying for, for, for patience. For I needed that on Friday um, with this construction project. And you need patience from time to time because things just don't go uh, the way that maybe we think they ought to go in life. And uh, there, there's communication gaps and all kinds of things. We, we can pray for that. And um, God uh, promises that His Spirit will be there whose fruit is patience to help us work through those things without blowing up, getting excited, and making a bunch of people mad, and then regretting it for the rest of the weekend, right? Because often that's the way it is. We, in the time of our need, when we need it most, can cry out to God and say, God, I need patience, right? This one. I need your strength to help me endure things that I wasn't planning were going to happen as I work together with other people in the accomplishment of a goal. God's there. God wants to meet that need in our life. That's according to his will. Um, and so that's really extreme. It, it really eliminates then asking God for things because of selfish reasons or selfish purposes. See, God's more than ready to, for us to, to meet our needs and to respond to our asking that shows we desire to be empowered with heavenly resources to serve him, right? God's more than inclined to do that. He wants us to ask for things that will reflect more of Christ in our lives. If you pray that, Jesus, I want more of you to be seen in my life, God's going to answer that prayer. God's going to allow that. That's a humble prayer of someone who says, I want more of Christ in his light to shine in my life. God would certainly answer that prayer because that's according to his will. When you're faced suffering in the name of Jesus, Jesus says, ask the Father when you need wisdom for witnessing. When you're sharing your faith with someone, someone asks you, it says, what do you believe? Or, you know, where do you go to church and why do you do that? Uh, you can pray right at that moment that God would give you the wisdom to know what to say to this brother or sister or this person that you're talking to that would encourage them and help them to understand the power of Jesus Christ for them. So ask, keep asking. Don't worry about asking. Don't hesitate to ask. Don't think that you can't ask or you have to ask through another source. You can ask through Jesus and in his name. He made it crystal clear five times in this chapter. You can ask the Father in my name. Okay? Pray. That's a tremendous privilege that not everybody 
takes advantage of. Not everybody knows the power of prayer. There's a final benefit, and this is perhaps the one that we, we probably fail to experience the most. And this is a, this is a benefit that comes to people um, and is much needed for people who live in a, in a climate where they have everything, where everything's been provided for them. This is something that will benefit you the most in a world that is inundated by materialism and all kinds of this and that and the other thing. Um, th- this is a benefit, and, and here it is that's mentioned in the passage. We gain, first of all, an understanding of God's wisdom. We receive, you know, the, the benefits of prayer. But Jesus wants to give you satisfaction and joy. The benefit of satisfaction and joy. Where you're truly satisfied. You're truly content. You're truly okay with life. And there's a joy that's in your life that isn't easily impacted by circumstances. Right? That isn't easily impacted by circumstances. God gives these benefits for our joy. So that, so that we would experience joy and that that joy might be complete. Complete. The complete satisfaction in Him. You see, when we get into the habit of asking and receiving from God, we learn that He is the ultimate source of satisfaction in life. We will not only, uh, and we will not look to any other source for it but God. God gives me satisfaction. I'll find complete satisfaction when my life is completely lived in the center of His will. When I'm totally satisfied with all that I need is Jesus. Jesus is enough. I can live with so much left, less in life when Jesus is enough. When He's the source of my satisfaction. See, Jesus wants our joy to be full. He wants our joy to be complete. And God has always stood ready to show us how He can satisfy our lives like no one else can. God has always stood ready to say, if you will trust me, I will give you complete satisfaction. You don't need this. You don't need that. I will supply you with the complete satisfaction for your life. I'll give you the joy. It'll be a complete joy. That's why Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life to the full, complete joy. Jesus didn't come to give us a mediocre life. He didn't come to give us a frustrated life. He didn't come to give us a life of despair, depression, or discouragement. He didn't come to give that kind of life. He came to give us life to the full, life to the abundant, life to the fullness of joy, and a joy that would be complete and satisfied. And that satisfaction would not be based on external circumstances that change all the time, don't they? but would be constant even though our circumstances of life are changing all the time. Jesus wants our joy to be full, complete, overflowing. And when it comes to His disciples, when they experience that joy that is complete and overflowing from abiding in Him, they'll be bearing fruit, they'll be growing as believers. It comes when the likeness of Jesus Christ is emerging from our lives. When we're growing and we personally experience the powerful indwelling presence of the Spirit in our life to make good decisions, to make good choices, to respond to the difficult circumstances of life. When we see the Scriptures come to life and take root in our hearts, joy is made full. You see, Jesus had our joy in mind when he went to the cross to die. Jesus died a horrific death so that we could experience joy in life. A joy that no one in the world had at the time. See, nobody had joy. The the Israelites didn't have joy because they were living under Roman oppression. 
They hated their lives. They hated living under the they, they, they were There's nothing joyful about living in Israel in the time of Jesus. Whatever joys were there were manufactured just for a moment, and people had to manufacture them from sources outside of themselves because it wasn't coming from in, from a heart that was at rest and peace because it was reconciled to God and reconciled with man. Jesus had our joy in mind when he went to the cross. Jesus made it possible for us to be restored to a personal relationship with God through his death. And his resurrection paid the way for God's abundant blessings to fall on our lives so that we could experience the fullness of his joy in our life every day. But I ask you, as I had to ask myself this week, are you experiencing the fullness of this joy in your life? Are you experiencing the fullness of this joy in your life? And in a lot of days I could say probably not. Kind of a tough thing for the pastor to say, trying to preach to you on joy when he isn't really experiencing it sometimes in his own life. I feel bad so many times that it, my life is so easily impacted by outside sources. Things that I know that are going to be, because this is an imperfect world, it's never going to be right. It's never going to, it's never going to be right. It's never going to be fair. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be complete. It's never, never, ever going to be that way. People are, there's always going to be an offense. There's going to be, there's going to be this, that, or the other. We're going to have to face hardships. We're going to have to face uh, things that, that just don't click the way that we want them to click. It's always going to be that way. And if our life is so, so much caught up in externals and so influenced by externals, we will never experience joy. We just won't. Joy is something internal and it comes from God and is experienced through Jesus. But we have to think what things in our life rob us of the fullness of joy that Jesus wants to bring in our life. Do we find ourselves depending too much on our own resources for joy? Rather than looking and say, God, you said I could pray and ask you for anything. I want joy today. A joy that's complete and full and a joy that will not be taken, will be strong and endure even though things change today. Even though I encounter situations that aren't so good or I wasn't expecting. I have a quote I want to read for you as we close this morning. I was reading that this week in one of the websites that I frequent, Gospel Coalition. Richard Baxter wrote this quote. I thought it was pretty, pretty powerful when he said, Oh, that Christians would learn to live with one eye on Christ crucified and with the other eye on his coming glory. That's our focus. Christ crucified, where he, he died to save me from his Christ coming again, where everything will be perfect and complete. If everlasting joys were more in your thoughts, spiritual joys would be more in your heart. No wonder you are comfortless when heaven is forgotten. When Christians let fall their heavenly expectations, but heighten their earthly desires, they are preparing themselves for fear and trouble. I like that one. When Christians let their heavenly expectations heighten, or heighten, or... Uh, 
let their fall, their heavenly expectations, and their earthly desires heighten. They are preparing themselves for fear and trouble. Who has met with a distressed, complaining soul where either a low expectation of heavenly blessings or a too high a hope for joy on this earth is not present? Ouch! Ouch! That was, that was painful. Distress and complaining souls come from low her, er, uh, heavenly expectations and very too high hopes for this earth and what we experience here. What keeps us under trouble is either we don't expect what God has promised or we expect what He did not promise. Jesus has given us spiritual understanding. He's given us the privilege of prayer. And most of all, He's given us the blessing and the benefit of satisfaction and joy. The question is, are we taking advantage of it? Do you remember how David had to pray after he sinned in his rebellion against the Lord? and had an affair with another woman and created a child through that relationship. He was an adulterous affair um, with another man's wife. How in the prayer in Psalm 51, he prayed, Lord, restore the joy of your salvation. Restore the joy. Maybe that's our prayer today. Lord, could you restore joy to my life? Could, it, could you make that joy more about Jesus and less about the things that are happening around me? Jesus, could you give me, in my heart, a satisfaction with you, just with you, that I would, that I would go deeper in this word to foster that joy that comes in knowing you so that my life is less affected by what's going on around me every day. And so that when people see me, they can see the radiance of Christ's joy that is unaffected by delays, by disappointments, by discouragement, by defeats, Father, you came to give us joy. You came to bring satisfaction to our soul. You came to give us life and life to the full. And you said, it will only come when you trust in me, when you walk with me, when you follow me, when you when you're willing to give up yourself in the futile pursuits of things in this world, when you're willing to to find the spiritual wisdom that I give to you to say that joy comes when it comes through surrendering your life to me. And Father, I pray for an attitude of surrender because I know um, there's probably a lot of folks in this room just like me who are struggling with joy in their life, with satisfaction, I'm sure that there are plenty of people in this room that are struggling with praying and depending on you and asking you for things. And I know there's plenty of people in this room who struggle seeking the counsel of your word and the spiritual understanding. And we're thankful, Lord, that you're gracious with us, you're kind, you're merciful, that you're patient with us, that you just come to us with spiritual wisdom and encouragement like we've received today from your word, to lift us up, to lift us up, to take us our focus and to help us to put on the spiritual glasses so that we can walk with wisdom and vision and understanding in this very difficult world, having your peace and your joy and your satisfaction to walk through everything that will come our way, knowing what happened in the past for our salvation and what is coming in the future.
for the glorification of our lives when we stand with you, Jesus Christ, in your presence forever. I pray, O oh God, that faith would come to the hearts of your people today who are needing salvation in Jesus Christ, that they would believe that he died for them and that he is there for them and that he wants to bring joy to their life. And I pray that those who you are working in their hearts and lives, you would draw them to a deeper walk with you and that they would seek someone out. They'd seek me out this week. They'd call me. They'd, they'd come up and talk to me after the service today to say, Pastor, your, the, the Spirit was speaking me to, to, to me today and I need some help with this. Lord, I pray for your will to be accomplished. I thank you today, too, for the opportunity to celebrate the new life that's already come to Frank and Linda and their lives and how they come to publicly acknowledge their faith in Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism. And I pray that this would be a joyous day for all of us as we celebrate what happens in the new life when we give our lives to Jesus Christ. And I pray that you'll be glorified in all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.